In today's video, we're gonna talk about the number one reason why most people fail at making compost. It's super easy, and by the end of this video, you should be well on your way to making an incredible static compost pile for your garden. Um, right beside me here, I've got three compost bays, and uh, these are composts that we inherited with the farm. And while they're close to the garden, which is great, uh, it's a pain in the butt to come and manage them. So this is reason number one. And you know that your compost pile is too far away if everybody in your family is trying to shirk the responsibility of taking the compost out to the compost bays. So eventually, these compost bays are gonna be closer to the house. Now, one of the reasons that people say that they don't want their compost close to their house is because it stinks. Well, if your compost stinks, it means that you suck at making compost and probably it also means that your compost pile is too far away. Um, and so one of the best ways to improve your compost making abilities is to bring it closer so that when it does smell, you're forced to figure it out so that it doesn't smell. A good compost pile shouldn't smell. And in fact, if a good compost pile smells, it means that you're not adding enough carbon. Now, most people don't realize that a compost pile should be 50 to 70% carbon by mass and we just recently um, we just recently mulched up a whole bunch of trees into wood mulch and so wood mulch is between three to five hundred to one units of carbon for every unit of nitrogen so it's pretty carbon rich we want to shoot for a compost pile that has a nitrogen, carbon to nitrogen ratio of probably about 50 to 1. A lot of the books talk about 30 to 1. And so the carbon to nitrogen ratio is basically the amount of nitrogen in the pile relative to the amount of carbon. And so when you're making a compost pile, you're basically making a recipe, you're making a cake, so to speak, and you got to get the ingredients right so that the critters, the microbes inside the pile can actually do their work. If they have too much nitrogen, it's like feeding somebody too much steak. And if they have too much carbon, it's like feeding somebody too much bread or too much potatoes. We need a balance between the amount of carbon to the amount of nitrogen. And so it turns out that we, you know, a 50 to one ratio is pretty good. You can get a 30 to one ratio, like I said, which is what most books talk about. But it turns out that because of the way that we treat our soils, most of us treat them pretty poorly, that we end up having um, a fungal deficiency in our soils. And the reason for that is that fungi is the first thing to disappear when we rototill or disturb our soils. So because of that, we wanna make sure that we create the right ingredients in our pile to uh, create the conditions for fungi to thrive. Now fungi, as a, as a microorganism, doesn't really start to appear in the pile until well after it's gone through its heating stage, so six months to a year. Um, meaning that once the pile has gone through its heating cycle and it cools down, then the fungi starts to show up. And so to make sure that we've got the best conditions for that fungi, we want to have enough carbon in there for it to thrive. So my recipe generally is about 50 units of carbon to one unit of nitrogen. And uh, I'm a big fan of static piles. And to make it really simple, like I said, number one, we have to make sure that the pile is close enough to the house. But number two, that the ingredients to bake the cake are really close to where the cake is being made. For the same reason that you wouldn't put a fridge in the kitchen and a sink in the garage and a stove upstairs in your house, we don't want to have our ingredients all over the place um, when we're making our, um, our compost pile. So we've mulched up a whole bunch of mulch. I'm gonna move it over here with the tractor. I'm gonna put it in the center bay and that way when we come out and dump a bucket of compost into this compost bay, we can also dump an equivalent amount of wood mulch into the compost at the same time so that as we're creating this layered static system, um, we're getting the right ratios correct. Now I called these static compost bays. They're called static compost bays because you set them up and you let them go through a compost cycle without turning them. So there's very little labor involved in this. The active compost systems that I've talked about in previous videos uh, our, our compost system similar to a Berkeley method where you flip it every day or every two days based upon temperature. Um, those give you compost really quick within 17 to 21 days. Um, they still need to age though, but uh, they're very fast at, at producing compost. 
Mind you, you have to put a lot of work into collecting all the materials so that you can build a pile in one day. These are very simple and um, according to Joseph Jenkins, he's a composting expert, he wrote the Human Error Handbook, uh, these systems actually work really effective, as effective as a Berkeley method. They take a lot less labor uh, and uh, you just have to wait a little bit longer for them, which is fine because if you're producing a lot of compost, um, as long as you've got a system kind of moving through, then you'll be able to uh, have compost on a regular basis. So the stuff that we're making today or this year will be ready for next season. Now the third composting method, which we're going to experiment with uh, probably next year, I suspect, is using a chicken system to um, feed the compost to chickens. They produce manure, giving them also the right carbon and nitrogen ingredients. Um, they also do the, the labor to flip it around and move it around. Um, they peck at it and, um, and they produce a really beautiful compost. And so I could see us uh, doing a chicken tractor on steroids similar to what Jeff Lawton talks about in some of his videos. Um, that would also be a really effective way to uh, produce compost. So let's get the mulch moved over. All right, so now we've moved the mulch over. Uh, I'm going to put a layer of carbon onto the compost that we've got started because it's getting a bit rich. And, um, and then we'll close with some closing thoughts. Okay. okay. So one of the things that we can also add to the compost pile is some wood ash. So I've got a, a bunch of it from the winter, so I'm going to throw some of that in. Um, just to in increase the amount of potassium in the pile and uh, any of the other micro or macronutrients that are actually in wood ash. Alright, so that's it for composting today. Hopefully those two tips help you out. One of the things that we also do, or the last tip I'll give to you, is in the compost bucket that we use. I don't have one here right now. Um, because they kind of get gross and stinky as you start accumulating compost in them, what we do is we line them with flyer paper. So paper that has a flyer from a local uh, grocery store or whatever, whatever comes in the mail for free. It's carbon again, and if we line the bottom of the bucket, then it doesn't get so goopy down there, it's easier to clean. And then clean your bucket before you bring it into the house. If your bucket starts to smell, the sun is honestly one of the best disinfection mechanisms you've got. So clean it out with a brush, a toilet brush or something like that not used for toilets. Um, although I guess it wouldn't really matter because you're not licking the bucket or anything, but it's kind of gross. Um, and then let the bucket sit in the sun for a little while and the, the, the UV rays will sterilize the bucket and take any of the odor out um, so that when you bring it back into the house your bucket doesn't smell anymore. So hopefully you got some value out of that. Um, we will um, keep you guys updated as this compost pile kind of moves through its cycle and we'll show you what comes of it in about a year from now. And um, leave any comments you have in the comment section down below. Thanks, guys.